I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to the elders of any other communities who may be here today. So we've got Craig um, Kestry with us today to talk about everything seeds and edible gardens. Um, Craig's an author, a horticulturist, an educator in self-sufficiency and mainly on an urban block, I believe. So not a big, not a big area. He's a regular TV and radio presenter and he's president of the Werribee Park Heritage Orchard. Um, he also is very experienced in running these workshops because he does a, does a lot of these himself. Craig's passionate about passing on his knowledge and showing us how to turn our gardens into beautiful productive spaces that will feed families with delicious fruit and vegetables. Um, so today he's going to discuss seeds and seed, seed um, saving and sowing. And now I'm going to hand over to Craig to take us through his, his wealth of knowledge and his slides. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, it's great to have you along. Uh, I was a bit shocked to hear that we had upwards of sort of 60 people interested and that's a great thing. I, I, I guess that um, um, it, it's heartwarming to know that people are starting to, uh, to get back to some of the things that we once used to do and took for granted. So uh, tonight uh, I'm going to talk about obviously seed saving, sowing and storing and uh, there's a bit to get through. So um, We've got a lot of slides and, and look, I generally try to answer uh, questions as we go, uh, but just pop them into a chat window and if I spot them and think I can deal with them, then I, uh, I will. Um, otherwise, we'll uh, hold over for a little bit of Q&A at the very end of the presentation. So um, if you don't collect your own seeds, you're going to need to buy them. So um, let, let's deal with buying seeds usually. Um, Seeds are either F1 hybrids or open pollinators. So um, I guess uh, we probably should talk a little bit about what is an F1 hybrid and what is an open pollinated uh, variety. And, and F1 hybrids are, or should, should I say, let's start with open pollinated varieties first. Open pollinated varieties are uh, varieties of vegetables um, or plants that, that are uh, pollinated by either insect, um, they're pollinated naturally by wind or by by animal. Uh, one of those three things. Whereas F1 hybrids are uh, interfered by with us. Uh, we take the pollen from one plant and put it onto the, another plant, and then we make a new plant out of it. So, and they're more likely to throw back to something that they've they've been um, they've been uh, crossed with rather than the open pollinated varieties, which will also cross. I might add, but they're less likely to. Um, and, and, you know, they've stayed reasonably true to type from their original parent plant. Um, when you go to look for them, you, you're going to need to inspect the seeds depending upon what they are. Um, they don't obviously, they, they don't, they're not always obvious as to when, what, uh, whether they are uh, open pollinated or F1 hybrid. So what you're looking for, and if you look up here at the top, uh, you can see Eversweet F1. That's what it's depicting. It's telling you it's an F1 um, hybrid. Um, this one, again, right next to the, the, uh, the name, the Gloria uh, F1. So um, some are not as, as easy to see. Um, open pollinated seeds can also be heirloom seeds. So in this instance, you've also got unpollinated down the bottom and uh, uh, an heirloom um, as the, uh, the thing to look for. This is straight out called heirloom. So. Um, and these are the ones that I tend to use most of all, um, mainly because they do tend to stay true to type, uh, which is really what you're looking to do. Um, and it's okay to buy your seeds initially, but if you're buying open pollinated seeds, then you need to then start and let some of the plants go to seed um, so that you can harvest the seed yourself. And that's really where we're headed tonight to see how we can go about that and what we need to do. And see, so there's great benefit of being able to allow some of these plants to go to seed because they attract in uh, beneficial insects, which is the real uh, a real benefit uh, for most. So I'm just going to uh, quickly um, turn off that background noise. So uh, this is a dill plant 
that um, I, I, you know is, has been allowed to go to flower. And uh, these things attract in ladybird beetles, praying mantis, hoverflies, which are beneficial insects to help you out in the garden. So you're not only are you going to get the seed from from this, but you're obviously going to also get the uh, the benefits of having let them go to seed uh, with these insects, and they'll they'll eat up some of the pests that you you may have, um, which which is a great thing. Um, and of course, uh, this is once they start to dry. So what I do is once the seed has or the flower has has burst and it's and it's now spent and it starts to dry, then I actually cut the flower stems off and I tie them together and pop them upside down into a brown paper bag, which is the easiest way to do it, I believe. And uh, just hang them up inside the garage or in the in the potting shed or the or the garden shed, whatever you use. And uh, the seeds will eventually fall out from the um, the seed pods and be dispersed down into the bottom of the bag. Um, it's very, very easy, seriously. Um, this is the ladybird that I was talking about on the uh, on the dill by just its very nature being in the garden will attract in, as I say, these wonderful um, beneficial insects, which is uh, wonderful. And here they are, hoverflies, ladybird beetles, you know, they eat up aphids. Um, there are all sorts of assassin type bugs that will eat up some of the, um, the chewing insects. So it really is crucial that you let some of your, your plants go to flower. And by that, I don't mean let every lettuce go to flower either, because otherwise you're going to have lettuce weeds. And believe me, you can get quite a lot of them when you, as you'll see when, when I show you uh, how lettuces are dispersed. Uh, but getting these guys into your uh, into your gardens um, really going to be beneficial to you reducing the amount of sprays you're likely to have to use. You know, there are no pests in nature. Um, the, the ecosystem tends to look after itself. And if you can attract in by using lots of um, biodiversity and, and increasing the amount of flowers as well as, um, and of course, the, the amount of vegetables you allow to go to, to flower that are very attract, attractive to some of these insects, you'll get them in and they'll do their work. This is a wonderful old fashioned plant that's certainly worthy of uh, most gardens, apart from the fact that it looks attractive. It gets quite uh, tall, uh, up to four to six feet tall. Uh, this is an elephant amaranth. And uh, the seed is, uh, uh, again, extracted by, um, by drying it, cutting the, the flower buds off. That's one big flower. Um, so you cut the stem off again. The small brown, uh, dark black seeds uh, resemble uh, that of what look like small metallic balls. And it's a wonderful old uh, ancient grain. Um, that once was used, bound, pounded up and used um, uh, as flour. Um, but the young leaves can, uh, are very tender and, uh, and great to be used in, in stir fries. But uh, the, 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 the seed dispersal of a lot of plants, um, depending upon what you're growing, of course, um, is quite interesting as to how they disperse. So um, these are dispersed by insect, uh, by, by birds. Birds, this is a curry leaf uh, plant, Maria. Uh, birds come along and perch once the seeds are ripe, they peck the seeds off and off they go and um, they, uh, they process the seed and wherever it falls, up comes the new plant. And some seeds, um, particularly not so much of these, but some actually need that to happen before they'll, they'll actually germinate. Fortunately enough, most of our vegetable seeds don't need that. Um, some are dispersed mechanically. So when an animal or we trod on uh, some of these types of seed pods, they actually expel the seeds in a squirt and they'll squirt some meters, sometimes up to six meters away um, and, and they expel the seeds. So um, of course, any of those sorts of um, seeds, and, and look, this is a squirting cucumber. So, uh, and generally considered a weed, but, um, as I say, the seed dispersal is quite interesting once you start to understand how plants uh, are reproduced. This is a thistle, but uh, the, the seeds are dispersed by wind. And uh, I, I have this here to um, uh, make a parallel to lettuce 
plants because lettuces and thistles are in the same family. And believe it or not, they're dispersed exactly the same way. Here's a lettuce in my backyard that's gone uh, to seed. And what I do is I only let one of each of the varieties that I grow. And if you have a look at the buds, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see, you can see they're very thistle-like and so are the tops of the seeds. They're not far away from being dispersed. And of course, uh, once they're, they're ripe and ready to go, uh, on, on a decent wind, the wind picks up the, the sails on the top of the seeds and carry them off, off into the distance. Um, sometimes, um, depending upon the time of year or what's in that bed, I'll bend those uh, plants over and rather than have to sow the seeds, I'll actually bend them down and give them a brush with my hand and disperse the seeds into a garden bed. Um, and it might have some sugarcane mulch in it, which doesn't matter, that's okay. Uh, I give that a bit of a scratch around and a water and then I pull the plant out and uh, in a few days time I start to get small lettuce seeds emerging uh, in that garden bed so and then I just simply use a knife to uh, to lift them and then replant them where I want them rather than let them all grow in the same spot so that's a tip uh, a different uh, uh, variety of lettuce and as you can see this one has yellow flowers um, and they produce a massive amount of of uh, seed as you can see with all of those buds yet to flower so um and here's some lettuce seeds pulled out and as you can see the lettuce the seeds are contained on the end of uh the wing that, that uh, actually carries them off into the distance um now they're quite fine obviously so you need to uh uh, be careful how you how you uh, sow them when you sow them because it's very easy to sow miles too many, which we'll touch on. Um, I also cut them off and do exactly like I said before with the dill. Um, right, what they are on the on the um, um, end of the the paper bag. Poke them in the end of it. Use a twist tie or something like that. A bit of string would be okay. Tie them up so that uh, they're up off the bottom of the bag. And the seeds all fall off down into the um, into the bottom of the bag, and it's a very easy way of being able to uh, to save seed. It takes no time, doesn't cost a lot of money, and uh, you've got them for uh, for good and all time. These are the sorts of um, lettuce weeds that I get come up in my um, in my garden beds. And as I say, it's about that stage where I'll just simply lift them with a small garden trowel or uh, an old knife and. I'll lift them and put them where I want them. Um, yeah, just like so. Very, very simple. Uh, don't leave them all there because you'll find that you'll just get far too many and they won't eventuate to, to very much. Um, of course, we've just been discussing quickly about tomatoes and uh, whilst it's been a fairly poor season for tomatoes, I am getting some that are ripening. Um, it's most important whilst you, if you're going to save tomato seeds, remember to try and remember to save the big ones. Don't eat those. Don't wait till the very end of the season where you've only got a couple of small tomatoes left. You want to try and get, um, and this goes for all plants, try and pick the plants that look the best or the biggest fruit, i.e. the tomatoes, make sure it's the biggest tomato. And when you cut that open, get the seeds out of that one because the genetics in this one are very good. And what happens over time is if you keep saving these seeds year after year, these seeds start to adapt um, and evolve around your rainfall, your climate, your soil pH, and so on. And you'll find that you'll get bigger and better yields year after year after year. And I was alluding to the fact that these seed libraries are a little bit like a food swap. And sometimes when you go to food swaps, if you've ever been to one, that some people bring in excess seedlings that they've been growing. And if it happens to be someone that's been growing tomatoes in your region and, and they've been growing them for many, many years, they have very valuable seedlings to get a hold of. You know, you've got some years of genetics being built on these. So you want to try and grab a hold of those as best you can. Now to um, take seeds out of tomatoes, it's very simple. And I think a lot of people tend to make this hard work and it absolutely isn't. Now, this is a black San Marzano, which is a fairly rare tomato that someone gave me. Um, so it's not terribly big. So sometimes beggars can't be choosers. You've got to take what you can get. Um, simply scrape out the pulp with the seed onto some absorbent paper. Um, don't wash the pulp off. 
Um, it, it doesn't do the seeds any good. The pulp is there for a very good reason. It actually helps when it gets rehydrated to, to assist the germination of the seed. So getting them into a, a, a you know, when it will sift and running them underwater is a counterproductive thing to do. So just let them dry on the paper. Once they've sat there for a couple of days drying, and simply fold them up in the paper. Make sure you write on the paper what they are so you don't forget. And then put them into an envelope and uh, pop them away to store. We'll talk about storage later on. And I can assure you that you won't be sorry you do this because in time you'll build some wonderful um, good growing tomatoes and or whatever else you say. There are some things in gardens that grow just about everywhere you allow the seed to drop. So it's a case of up to you as to how you deal with these. These are garlic chives and garlic chives will set seed everywhere you let them grow. So um, what I tend to do is to cut these off once they start to um, die off and, and I don't let them mature uh, on the plant because otherwise you'll have them everywhere. As you will, if you can see just down below, this is a red leaf sorrel that's in my path. And that's also another one that can not so much be invasive, but it will get everywhere if you're not careful, if you're not diligent. So, um, and they're easy if you want to save the seeds, by all means, same deal, just pop them in that bag and, and let them um, complete their cycle by drying out and the seeds will drop into the bottom. Um, should I save my tomato seeds this year? Um, the tomato is not the best, I think, because of the weather. Um, look, I'm saving mine this year and I think that it's best if you can save them year on, but I would be picking the biggest of them, not the smallest. So really matter for you. Um, seeds remain viable um, for some time. They lose about 10% of their viability. So viability means um, the percentage uh, success you'll get in germination. So they lose a small percentage germination um, over, over time. So um, you're looking at um, about 10% per year. So you know, in 10 years' time, you may not be getting very many uh, when you plant, you know, 100 seeds, you might get maybe 9 or 10. Uh, at the moment, you plant just about 100 seeds, you're likely to get 100 struck. So I've, at I've what point... A, sorry, um, Craig, I've got another um, question. I'll just yep. interrupt. Another question from Leslie. Are there any questions, are there any seeds not worth saving? Um, will not grow true to type? Oh, look, there are probably... The F1 hybrids I wouldn't bother with because they're likely to throw back. Um, if they've been open pollinated, if they're an open pollinated variety, and that's why I'm encouraging people to go down that path, um, they tend to stay true to type. So, um, and look, there are some things that, that can be a bit troublesome to start, um, but I think they're all worth giving a go, uh, particularly if you can get them adapted to your surroundings. And you guys are in the Macedon Ranges. So, I used to live uh, that way many years ago, and um, you know it's a wonderful part of the world. And, and you're fortunate that uh, for, for a lot of things they, they grow well because of you know how cool it is, and also how hot it is in the in the summer. So obviously this year's one out of the bag, unfortunately. But I I absolutely would be saving some tomatoes from this year for sure. Um, at what point do you cut and hang a paper bag? Sorry, Mister Judas creamy child, on my toast. Um, at what point do you cut uh, and hang the paper bag? So as the seed starts to dry off, so this is a good example here. See how this seed has, uh, this flower, should I say, has started to dry off. I'd wait for that colour to be lost. So instead of this nice pink, vibrant colour and it starts to go a bit of a grey colour, I would then cut that off and then hang that in the bag. And that goes for all flowers. Once they've lost their colour and they look like they're starting to dry, then I would use that. But both of these can be grown by division, which means stick a shovel between the, uh, the leaves and, and put your heel on it and push it down to the ground and make new plants that way if you, if you must. Um, like I said, if you leave these go to flower and drop their seeds where they, where they land, you'll have, they're a bit like spring onions. You know, I, I can't remember the last time I've even had to ever grow spring onions from seed. I just let them fall where they land. So I let one out of a dozen or so uh, grow and one, one will go to seed, should I say. And it produces probably 50 or 60 seeds easy, drops onto the ground, 
up they come and then I just simply lift them with the garden trowel, separate them and then go and plant them where I want them. And they become very, very hardy because they're adapting to your climate. They become unique to you and, and your, your backyard. So um, it, it's worth doing. Um, you, you'll get much better success. Now, of course, it doesn't necessarily just need to be vegetables or herbs. You can dry uh, flowers. Now, these are marigolds. And marigolds aren't actually flowers. They're florets. So when you actually pull the what looks like a petal off a marigold, it actually you have a really close look at it. It's got a stamen and stigma on it. Each one of those is a flower. And, of course, each flower produces a seed. So you let them dry, uh, semi-sun dry them out in the sun, and then simply pull a tuft of the petals out. And here you go. There's all the seeds. Now, that's just out of one flower. So look at the amount of... So each one of those long black pieces on the end are seeds. So they produce an enormous amount of seed. And marigolds are one of the the great uh, defenders in your garden as far as companion plants are concerned. And I tend to fill my garden up throughout um, with marigolds, you know, particularly over the warmer months. Um, they're great for tomatoes to ward off nematodes in the soil. Um, their foliage is aromatic, so they tend to repel sap-sucking insects like thrip. <coughs> Excuse me. Aphids don't particularly like them. So if you've got plants that are a bit susceptible for getting aphids, then plant marigolds near them. Um, underneath your roses, if you're getting aphids on your roses, they'll attract in hoverflies. Hoverflies eat aphids. So they're a wonderful, diverse plant that not only adds attractive, uh, you know, some, some attractive aspect to your gardens, but they also bring, you know, some of these beneficial insects. And they also act as a masking plant to ward off um, some of the pests that are likely to attack your plants. Masking plants are fantastic. Even chives do that a bit. You know, they're, they're a great plant to have um, in your garden. So one of the other things I tend to do with uh, a lot of these companion type plants um, is, is grow them in pots because you can't always be guaranteed that you've, you've picked the right plant to put plant right next to what, you know, might, might, may or may not bring pests. So I make some of these mobile by putting them in pots and then I take the pot to the problem uh, just for the, the small amount of time to, to sort out get rid of the aphids or the white fly or whatever the case may be so um, so grow them yourself now I'll just scroll back without making you dizzy you can see that there's a lot of um, scarf chaff or whatever you want to call it it's a lot of um, material in amongst all of these seeds when you start to break them up a little bit that you don't really want um, and it's a bit counterproductive so Rather than try and pick through it all, there's a great old-fashioned method uh, called winnowing. And what you do in a slight breeze is from one bowl to another, put all the seeds and all the scarf, and you tip from one bowl to another very, um, very slowly, and it will blow the scarf out from all the seeds. And if you do it enough, it doesn't take very long. Um, it will blow all the scarf and all you'll be left with is the seeds. So it's an old-fashioned thing to do, but it's uh, no less uh, uh, applicable than, than it was then than it is today. Um, there are some things that grow by seeds, and one of those is Jerusalem artichoke, but they also grow particularly well from, from tubers. So um, sometimes some things are better to be grown whilst they can be grown from seed. Uh, if they can be grown by tubers, um, well and good, That's uh, so either way is, is okay. Um, sunflowers, another fantastic plant to have in amongst your gardens, not only for uh, um, the, the visual stunning aspect that they, they give, but uh, again, for the, uh, the attraction of the beneficial insects that they bring into your garden. Um, and there are some wonderful types of uh, varieties. I came across some terrific ones this year. That's uh, yet another one, and this one, uh, by the way, you can see the marigolds in the garden. Um, that's a stunning one, that one. That went to six foot tall and uh, heaps and heaps of uh, flowers, um, something like about 20 or 30 flowers on this. They went, um, that would have been probably about, um, probably about 200 millimetres in, in diameter. Uh, so it was quite a large sunflower, but uh, yeah, striking it is. 
So to save sunflower seeds, let them dry. Let them dry to the point where the petals will just about all crumple up. And as you can see around the perimeter of this sunflower, that um, the petals have dried up and the uh, yellow buds on the face of, of the sunflower, if you rub that with your hand, you'll find that they'll, um, they'll rub off, leaving the seeds behind. And all you basically do is you break the sunflower in half. Um, you can um, easily push the seeds out. And uh, as I say, when you'll harvest hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seeds out of just one, one sunflower. Um, I just noticed that we had another question, so I'll try and deal with that while we're going. Uh, for those gardens that have been impacted by herbicide contamination, can we still save seed? Yes, you can. We have tiger alpha tomatoes and we've managed to survive the contamination, but the fruits are not great. Is it best to throw them away and start again? Um, uh, oh, look, I'd save them. Uh, I'd save them. Um, Honestly, the, the best, whatever you choose to save your seeds from, the very best that you can get will always give you the very best results the other end. So, you know, if you're not satisfied with the tomatoes and you think that it, they're probably a little poor, then maybe, you know, um, give it a go another, uh, another time again next year and see how you go. Um, and, and hopefully you don't have that sort of contamination. Um, yeah, look, the use of chemicals, I'm afraid, um, in gardens is, is hopefully going to be a soon, sooner thing of the past. We really need to learn um, to, to do away with a lot of these chemicals. And it's, uh, I know it's difficult on some properties, but um, there, there are alternatives. And there are, there's even some, some certified organic herbicides these days that will, will, uh, will help. I know they're a bit more expensive than... Um, than things like glyphosate, but we just really should be trying to keep these that sort of stuff away from our uh, our gardens if possible. Um, beans are another one, of course. Uh, beans are uh, are being picked currently, so um, the ones that you occasionally think, oh, I should have picked that a bit earlier, let them keep going. Uh, you know the ones that start to bulge, and you know that that's going to get a string in it. Well, let it keep growing to the point where it will continue to get bigger and bigger and, and let it let it do that until it starts to dry a little bit, starts to go a bit wrinkly on the uh, on the plant, then pull it off and let it dry in the sun and then crack it open and save the seeds. And that goes for, for broad bean seeds. Um, I, I've, I've got scarlet runner beans here. Um, so they're a little different. They, they uh, you can allow them to get quite long. Um, but well, even the dwarf French beans and any of the, uh, the climbing beans are, all the same, Bellotti beans even are the same. So get them to dry, and um, make sure that you uh, you are drying them properly. Don't don't dry them inside a plastic bag. Um, they won't dry. They will basically uh, condensate and they'll rot. So it's really important to make sure that you put them into something like uh, a paper bag. As far as I'm concerned, that's that's my opinion. It's the best way to do it. Small paper bags are generally good, and they breathe a little so that they uh, allow the the air to escape on, on cue. <laughs> um, yeah, so in, into uh, paper bags or envelopes is just as good. Something you can write on, make sure that you're always writing. What I tend to do is to write down the date. And I also keep a bit of a diary when I'm saving seeds, um, particularly stuff that I've, and, and I write the dates of when I collected them. So I can sort of track um, when I've collected each year. I mean, it's interesting to sort of look back and, and work out. Plus it'll give you some idea of, the viability of the seed, so you, you remember, oh geez, I picked that a long time ago. Um, that's probably time I should go and collect some more if you, you're not doing it year after year. Um, and I also put down any notes that I might think about, you know, if someone gave me some seeds, I'll write down who gave me those seeds. So I remember if, I, if I'm unsuccessful at growing some again, I might get back in touch with that person and ask them again for some. So. You know, it's a great way of being able to record some of these um, some of these details. But if you forget to do it, you uh, you'll miss out. Uh, I agree with no chemicals, Craig. I never choose chemicals, but sadly, the soil mixes have been badly contaminated this year. Now I'm having to work on healing the soil in some of my beds. Yes, look, I agree. Um, one of the sad things is that a lot of the um, 
uh, a lot of these contractors that are taking council waste and composting are using some pretty ordinary methods to accelerate the composting rates and they're not doing it properly. And they're delivering contaminated soil that's um, heavily infected and in, uh, impacted with uh, microplastics, which is bad enough, but they're also very high uh, alkaline soils, which can sometimes be nearly toxic to the plants. And um, as you rightly point out, then there's the chemicals, stuff that's been sprayed with glyphosate, uh, all sorts of different herbicides. So it's uh, you've got to be very careful about what you buy and where you get it from these days, unfortunately. Um, yeah, at best if you can, don't import soil. The soil you've got is the very best soil you'll ever get. All you gotta do is work with it. Um, and I know sometimes that's easier said than done. One of the methods that I use is a no dig method, um, particularly when I've got a blank canvas, I'll even go out and buy bales of straw and I'll put cardboard down over the ground, fertilize over the top of it, wet it really, really well so it's saturated, sit straw bales on the top of it. And then with a garden trail stick, my garden trail into the straw bales and then put some pockets of good potting mix and a bit of compost and I'll, I'll plant the whole top of the bales out end to end um, and over time and I'll, it instantly gets me planting into something that's healthy and fresh and, and and over time what happens is the composting insects get a chance to come up to the to the top soil they eat through the cardboard and they slowly decompose and eat down the straw bales because you're watering and you're still harvesting food. Um, and it takes about 12 months for these straw bales to eventually, you know, um, be rotted down into the soil. And you simply turn over that soil. And let me tell you, money can't buy the soil that that makes. And the insects do that work for you. There's no turn, there's no hard work. Uh, it's just initially you've got to do a little bit of, uh, you know, scampering around to get that sort of stuff. So, um, can I go passion fruit from passion fruit seeds? It's got to be a little careful with passion fruit seeds. You'll notice that um, a lot of passion fruit are grafted these days, which means that they've been um, cross pollinated by us, by humans. So that tends to mean that they, they may well revert back to one of the parent plants that it was crossed with. And if one of those crosses is a banana passion fruit, you'll rue the day you ever put it in the ground. So be a little careful as to what variety you're using. Um, some of the plain old black passion fruit, ungrafted, are, uh, are okay. But if it's been grafted, I'd be careful. Um, no, not, not lemons or citrus, no. They've got to be grafted. They, have to, they don't stay true to type. Same with any deciduous fruit tree. That's why they're grafted, so they stay true to type. You know, if you grow, um, well, let's say for, 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 um, for, uh, for, for, for argument's sake, a... Um, Washington navel orange from seed. You won't get a Washington navel orange tree. You'll get something that is an orange, but it won't be Washington navel. It has to be grafted. And and, and that's the reason because, you know, we've, we've got over 13,000 apples globally to choose from. And here in Victoria, we can grow around about 1,800 different varieties of apple. And if you grow a Granny Smith from a from a seed, you won't get the Granny Smith apple. That's why they're grafted. It's the only way you keep them true to type. So um, now storing seeds is also something that you need to be very careful about. You need to make sure that um, you keep them away from vermin. So what I like to do is make sure I put them in something that has a, a lid that I can simply slip um, in across and keep the vermin out. Um, but I, I, I like something that breathes. Again, it needs to get air, but it needs to also be dark and away from moisture. So, um, and as you can see, this isn't mine, but uh, I've used this as an example. This isn't a bad idea. Keep the stuff that you're working with in the season and keep the stuff that you've planted and is about to go out of season, put it in the out of season site. So, but again, I also, um, and I don't grow all of my seeds. I sometimes... Um, buy seedlings, just depends on how I'm tracking for uh, the season and time. Um, and I try and stay ahead of the seasons, um, but I also sometimes have to buy them as well. So, um, yep, okay, so look, no dig gardens and, uh, and those sorts are very, very good. 
I can't remember how to pronounce that um, that German method, but yeah, that's used with timber in the bottom of it and so forth. So, um, or yeah, yes, you can use silica if you want to keep the moisture out, but it's easier to make sure you're using all the right things. Don't use any plastic. Make sure you're using paper envelopes um, and, uh, and and something that's going to breathe. It, that they'll stay good. So you know, here's another example. Um, in a plastic container, but again, I would drill holes in there so that they could breathe. You don't want them locked up uh, where they can't. Um, and of course, always make, make sure mice love these. So you're keeping your seeds out uh, in the garden shed where it can be sometimes a bit cool uh, and, uh, and you know, and, and, and it, you, unprotected, you're likely to get mice leak through all your packets. So just be careful. When it comes to sowing seeds, um, there are so many different methods. Uh, you can sow direct, um, things like uh, beans, peas, um, corn, um, pumpkins, zucchini, um, there are all sorts, particularly more so the, um, you know, warmer crops. Um, even some of the melons, they grow really easily directly in the ground. But make sure when you prepare the ground that you, you, um, you know, you get it reasonably good. Don't, uh, don't dig great big holes to put seeds in. The rule of thumb is generally about uh, a cover twice, twice the thickness of the seed with soil. So, you know, you can imagine those fine carrot seeds or uh, lettuce seeds, they're quite small. They don't really need a lot of um, coverage. Uh, I, I also plant carrots um, direct where they are to go. Um, and I've got some methods that I, I use and I'll talk, talk to you about that shortly. Um, but make sure that you do pat down the soil once you've, you're satisfied that it's worked and raked out, um, you know, where you're going to put your seeds. Me, I try not to grow things in rows. So I, I tend to grow things in the food forest type format or um, so that they're surrounded with companions. I mean, I never ever plant tomatoes together, for instance, um, because you instantly put them into competition for food, water and light. And if one gets a pest or a disease, they all get it. So, and because the insects have got fairly poor eyesight, they, uh, they recognize things very easily. So if you've got you know, a whole row of cabbage in, um, in, in your garden beds, you can expect that the cabbage white butterfly is going to find them pretty quickly. Whereas if you've got one cabbage surrounded by other things, they tend to fly over the top of it and not see it and move on. And particularly if you've got a masking plant, something like maybe a marigold beside it that they might not like the smell of, then they definitely will move on if they even, if they even land near it. One of the things I do with, <clears throat> excuse me, brassicas, and that's something we should be starting to think about planting now, um, I always put a white viola or a white pansy in the ground because when they flower, they look a little bit like the uh, white cabbage moth. And white cabbage moths, again, as, they, as I say, they have fairly poor eyesight. They, if they see a mess of white, what look like butterflies, they will stay away. They do not like competition. So they're likely to fly over the back fence to someone that's got the neon signs out and they've got their cabbages in a row. So uh, I tend not to do this. Um, you know, uh, planting in a row. There are some things on, on the other hand that do have to be planted like this. Um, some of those are corn, particularly, um, uh, white marigold, uh, white viola or white pansy. Um, so, um, so corn has to be grown really in blocks because it's wind pollinated. Same with broad beans. Uh, and if I do plant corn, obviously it's too late now, but I also plant uh, beans around the outside of it because corn is a nitrogen hog and it takes a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. And when you plant beans around the outside of it, guess what grows on the roots of beans? Nitrogen, they're nitrogen fixing. So the beans give back the, the, the corn some of what they take out. And of course, the corn provides um, something for the the, uh, the beans to climb on, saves you having to worry about putting a trellis up. Uh, and there is a, another one, there's a, there's a trilogy in this, you can also surround them with some cucumber, the cucumber helps shade the soil as well. But they're the two main ones. And um, I have a catch cry that, you know, what goes well on the plate together goes well in the ground together. So, you know, basil, tomato and garlic are marriage made in heaven. So at the end of this month, you should be looking about putting garlic in 
Uh, when I put my garlic in, I put all the bulbs in the crisper of the fridge for about a week. And, uh, and then I pull them out and um, plant them individually. I don't worry about taking the skin off um, on the outside. Just, just peel them into single cloves. And I think about where I'm going to put a tomato. And I'll put a circle of garlic, maybe about a dozen in a ring, about maybe 900 mil or to a metre wide. And X marks the spot for a tomato in October, November. Um, and then I'll interplant that with some basil. But in the meantime, while I'm waiting for that, those months to pass, I'll plant some, maybe some Asian greens, some bok choy, pak choy, um, maybe some coriander, might be some spring onions, other things in amongst uh, the, 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 um, the garlic until I'm ready to plant the tomato. So, uh, and I'll have a, a, you know, a ring of that there and a ring somewhere else in the garden and so on, dotted here and there. Um, so that's a great way of being able to help um, disperse your vegetables, surround them with the companions, make sure you've got some marigolds and so forth in those groups to help repel pests and so on. So it's a very different method of being able to, uh, to, uh, to grow food. Um, this is a seed disperser and um, sorry that that's not a bit clearer on the lid, but um, that has, uh, you're able to rotate that lid if you haven't already seen one of these um, to match the size seed so that they only let out a couple when you're, when you're putting them in. So um, these seeds, oh, probably I suppose with my big hands, they'd be probably hard to, to put out one at a time. So these just simply help and you can get them online. Um, I'm a member of the Diggers Seed Club um, and I know they sell them um, and as do other, other seed merchants. So, um, but very helpful. If you're gonna raise your own seeds, please don't try and use your own soil. Um, you'll get yourself into all sorts of strife. Get yourself a decent um, quality um, seed raising mix of some sort. It's generally got um, sandy loam and rice husks um, and a little bit of washed sand in amongst it generally. Um, unless you're gonna sift your own compost and it's really, really good, um, then I'd say, okay, but please don't use your own soil. You, you'll, you'll do yourself. Um, it, you, it, look, it's just not worth doing, seriously. Um, so, and generally people ask me about brands. I don't have any affiliation to this particular company. I use whatever I can get a hold of that is of this decent quality. I, I tend not to buy the cheapest because generally when it's extremely cheap, it's so is the ingredients in it. So I'd rather, um, I'd rather get good success. Um, depending upon what you're going to sow your um, seeds in, um, you know, seedling trays or um, peat pots or what have you, uh, use a dibble stick, uh, maybe a pencil is okay. This, that's what they've used in this instance uh, and uh, poke some holes in, not too deep, depending upon the seeds, obviously, um, and try and um, disperse the seeds uh, into evenly into these. This, this helps when you come to pull the seed seedlings out, unless you're going to grow them into individual uh, pots like uh, something like this. Now, these are commercial um, seeds that actually have um, a hormone and some fertilizer on the outside of them. Um, and they generally put two uh, in per pot. Um, Generally, when you're doing, I, I don't do that because, again, you've got to thin them out if they're, uh, if it's something like broccoli or cabbage or collie, um, I, I just put one in per pot, but um, it's up to you. Um, I've got this here, and I know that's I'm terribly sorry, that's a bit fuzzy too the now that I've blown it up, but um, I've got this here so that you, you, you understand, and let me um, get my highlighter here where I'll just put that red dot. These are seed leaves. These are the first leaves that you see um, come up out of the ground. Now, they provide, and they're called cotyledons, um, and, and this is a dicotyledon because there's two seed leaves on the, that germinate from the seed. Monocotyledons are singular. Uh, they come up off things like the alums, onions, spring onions, um, corn, um, there, there are a few, <clears throat> excuse me. These provide all of the food necessary for that seedling until 
they have their first set of adult leaves. So please don't be tempted to fertilize the seed raising mix or those young seedlings until they've well and truly got their first set of adult leaves. Most important. Okay. Watering. Um, be very careful not to use too heavy a uh, rose on a watering can or a hose or in fact quite often I'll use a spray bottle. You can get these little gadgets that will adapt up to a small um, plastic um, uh, plastic empty drink container um, and a small squirt and, and they're very very fine holes. Careful not to wash out the seedlings. Um, just bear with me, I've got another question here. Does the food forest format eliminate the need for formal crop rotation? Absolutely it does, because you're not cropping. Um, and generally when you do use things like corn and so forth, your companion planting them so that what the plant is taking out is being replenished by what your companion planted it with. So I don't do any crop rotation whatsoever. Um, and there's no need basically. Um, you know, even when it's garlic season, I, I dot that everywhere. I don't plant that in a whole block or, or crop because it's susceptible to rust. And if one gets it, I can deal with it. I can pull the, the, the affected plant out and I'm safe. But if you've, if you've got that all in one bed and you get rust, it'll go right through the whole lot and you lose the, the crop. So, you know, cropping is for farming, farmers, and, and it's a lot of hard work. Um, Ask them, they'll tell you, or they've got to work the soil very hard. Um, they're, they're forever replenishing what they're taking out of the soil because of this cropping scenario. They've got to worry about, well, most of them don't these days, they don't worry about crop rotation, but those that are cropping should worry about crop rotation. Um, and the other problem is then there's the pest and the disease. So, you know, they're spraying somewhere between four, six, and sometimes up to eight times from paddock to plate. Now, the whole reason for me to grow my food is to raise it organically so I know what, well, I, I don't spray. I'm a beekeeper as well, so I, I don't spray anything in my garden. And if I do spray something, it's not a chemical. It's something that I can either put on my, if I can't rub it on my skin, drink it or eat it, I don't use it. So it's things like detergent sprays or garlic or chilli sprays and those sorts of things. You know, for mildews, I'll use um, some, some milk and water, you know. Um, you know, weed killers, I'll use vinegar. You know, there, there are so many alternatives out there that work just as well as, as the chemical things, you know. So um, um, when you're raising seedlings, you know, depending upon where you're raising them, and I guess uh, with you guys up in the Macedon Ranges, they're, they're certainly coming out of winter when you're trying to get things like tomatoes and basil and some of those, you're trying to get the jump on, on spring. Um, you may need to resort to, you know, getting yourself a small, seed raising box sometimes you can get some with heat mats that are thermostatically controlled and so on um you know uh, or a small greenhouse or cold frame like this um, these are particularly good because um once you've got your season your um your uh your seeds up and raised um with these sorts of uh lids that you can hold up you can actually easily harden them off which i'll talk about shortly um, yes, milk, there's a range of things. I mean, look, that's a whole another workshop, companion planning and, and working on um, disease and so forth. So um, yes, it does work, but you've got to also make sure that you're removing um, dead, diseased or damaged or yellowing leaves from everything in your garden every day. Uh, I do the rounds every day and it doesn't take long. It only takes five minutes. So I, I go out there and, and, and anything that's looking ordinary, I take off because the pests and disease only attract the weak uh, in the plant kingdom. So if you've got weak plants or weak things on the plants, that's where you'll get the disease in. So, and using the milk will, will help. Uh, it doesn't always cure, but it certainly helps. Um, this, is, this is another um, um, uh, example of a cold frame. It's an old window, disused window um, with a small sleeper garden. Uh, at the bottom, you don't have to go and spend a fortune to get good results out of uh, repurposing or reusing something that uh, will help you out. Carrots. Um, carrot flowers are um, 
you use your seeds in a room with a fireplace, yep. Um, about 26 degrees as soon as they germinate and move them into an unheated, yep. Okay, so, yeah, look, as I say, I'm, I'm likely to cover most of what you, um, you're you talking about at the moment. So, um, these carrot seeds, uh, carrot flowers are quite dense, as you can see. Uh, again, they're a wonderful thing to um, allow to go to flower. They're quite large um, and they'll attract in wonderful um, uh, insects as well. But before you go planting uh, carrots, make sure that you um, sort out the soil. You may need to uh, have a bit of a dig around. Um, I tend, as I say, not to try and work my soil, but if I'm putting carrots in, uh, depending upon where I'm putting them in, I do dig around and make sure that there's no rocks because, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that's going to happen. The other thing you've got to make sure you don't do is don't fertilise the ground you're going to put carrots in. Otherwise, they'll wind up like that. Um, carrots don't like fertiliser, I can assure you. So if you fertilise your ground and turn it over with wonderful manures and so forth, guess what? You're going to get carrots that, uh, that are not terribly uh, good looking. Um, and they're a bit hard to deal with. Whilst they eat okay, they're not, not a problem, but yeah. Um, when you plant carrots, um, because they're very fine, you generally need to mix them up with a little bit of uh, seed raising mix so that when you disperse them, um, they come out evenly. But I actually like doing one more thing to that. And I put in equal amounts of radish seeds and I sow them all together for reasons I'll show you very shortly. It saves me having to thin the carrot seeds out because if I go back, as you can see, they're quite thick. Um, and there's just not enough room for them to develop properly. So they need, you know, quite every every second or third one pulled out to make way. But when you plant radish seeds in amongst the group, what happens is the radishes move the carrots along and they're far faster to grow than the carrots. So you'll harvest the radish seeds in the seeds in probably somewhere around about six to seven weeks time, whereas the carrots will take much, much longer than that. So that's a great way of being able to utilize the same amount of space, basically. Um, and and you, you let, let something else do the thinning for you. More about trying to take the hard work out of some of this gardening, I can assure you. I don't have a lot of time. When you put down your carrot seeds, make sure that you dig a small, um, furrow or rut um, it needs to be quite shallow pack it down a little bit so that you don't have any crevices or holes that may um, have seeds fall deep down into a crevice that's not what you want you want a nice smooth um, layer for the seeds to rest on and then simply cover them up a little bit and then I, I, I water them in well and then I put a plank of timber over the top of them and I leave them there until they start to germinate so that keeps the moisture really well um, underneath um, and I get great success this way. Same with the radish. The, the radish will sit there and germinate underneath these planks, no problem at all. Uh, you could use uh, uh, under felt with carpet. You can use carpet if you want, but I find that the planks do, do a, a fine job. Um, make sure you label your seeds. So you're going to put multiple varieties of seeds in the one seed tray make sure you label the rows for obvious reasons. Try not to overplant the seeds because at some point you have to thin them out. Um, I sometimes prefer to grow them in punnets just like this, reuse the punnets that you're buying much uh, much easier. If you only use pots, make sure these, these tomato seedlings are going to start and get leggy, as you can see, very thin and spindly. This is because they haven't been put outside and they need to. You need to get them outside or undo the, the um, you know, whatever you're growing them in the greenhouse and, and get them out in the sun during the day. Don't leave them inside these greenhouses because that's what they'll do. They'll search for the light. It's most important that once you've got some decent, um, you know, two sets of adult leaves, you need to get them out during the day and then in during the night. It's the overnight low temperatures with tomatoes that is the problem. You know, the overnight low temperatures down in the single finger, finger Single digit range is where tomatoes generally tend to get set back. So get them back in where it's warm. And during the day, they'll, they'll, they'll happily harden up for you. Um, and just about a week before you're ready to put them in the ground, keep them out all night. Um, 
you want to try and make sure that you get them down into pots, pop them up as they go. You know, this is a good size, um, not leggy. It's, it's starting to show some good signs. And you want to make sure you're getting good purple stems on your tomatoes before they go in the ground. That will tell you that these tomatoes are hardened off. If they're, if they're um, pale green, that tells me they're not been hardened off. So if you're going to go and buy seedlings down the track, look for the purple stems first. If they're not purple stems, walk out, go somewhere else. Um, garlic season, I've alluded to that before, it's um, coming up. So um, you can grow garlic from seed if you let the, the um, escapes, which are the flower buds, uh, form and flower. Um, but obviously planting them by, um, by bulbs is much, much easier. I generally plait them um, and hang them up, as you can see, um, in my garage. Um, and, and think about that companion scenario. Also, if you've got apple trees, plant some garlic bulbs at the base of your apple trees. That'll help keep codling moth away. Um, these are walking onions. So if you've never seen walking onions before, this is another way of, um, they've flowered and they've, and they've grown bulb, bulblets, as you can see on the top. And what happens is they become top heavy and they lean over and then eventually fall to the soil. And wherever they hit the soil, they take root and up they come and hence the um, um, walking onion. So they're another great one to look out for. Shallots are another one, red shallots, French shallots and brown shallots. It's coming up time to get those in the ground as well. So keep an eye out for them. You can, you can order these online if you don't have them. Um, there's some more of the shallots and the small bulblets that you can uh, you can plant. Um, oh, seed potatoes. See, we haven't not quite done yet. Um, spuds, whilst it's not time, but I have this here just to remind you that you, know, you should be buying um, seed potatoes you possibly can because they often carry uh, or can carry some disease that you really don't want in your soil. Uh, down the track because you won't get rid of it from your potatoes. So certified seeds are generally the way to go. You can split these in half down to a couple of eyes. Uh, I often grow them in bags and I generally put them in, in the, uh, uh, after the last frost, which is sort of um, where you guys are, I would guess probably um, early October, uh, possibly. Um, and if you don't get frost, then get them in earlier. Um, but uh, yeah, that's another seed that I thought I'd better throw in and just in case. Um, look, that's the end of my presentation. Um, just before we go, I'll let you know that um, um, I'm the author of these two books, uh, Edible Gardens, A Practical Guide. I wrote about five years ago and it's actually more uh, applicable today than it probably was back then. More people are more interested in uh, doing what we're doing. So it's a complete and utter guide how, on how to turn your garden into becoming a very productive one. Uh, and all the things you can do to, uh, to to make that happen, including worm farming, composting, and the like. Um, it's got an extensive um, uh, list of um, uh, companion plants and so forth. The Plant Profiles book uh, I released last year, and that has over 100 plus uh, plant edible varieties in there with a comprehensive way of being able to grow them. So that one tells you how to grow what you're putting in your edible garden. They're available um from my website uh at um www.craigcastry.com.au if you look me up on facebook uh i write a daily post on plant profiles or a tip of some sort um just look for edible gardens by craig castry in facebook um i run online workshops weekly so if you're looking to learn some more of this stuff then i'm running these all the time um I will stop my sharing and I'll open up um, this for uh, a bit of a Q&A and see how we can go with that. There you go. So if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Does you know, Dick? Does anyone have any questions that they want to ask Craig while we've got his attention? Thank you very much for today's effort. That was really appreciated. No worries, my pleasure. Have, have you got 
Craig, have you got any suggestions of what we can do to the contaminated soil in our gardens? What process we should follow? Um, look, um, it's going to take a little bit of time, so I will keep it mulched, um, keep feeding it up with a pelletised type manure or whatever sort of organic manure you you're uh, you're using. Don't don't overdo it, but uh, and just allow the composting insects to work with it. And um, yeah, it's only going to take time. Yeah. Okay. Any idea uh, how long? Oh, uh, do you know yeah. what it was that was contaminated with? Well, and what sort of amounts? I mean, that's the difficulty in all of this. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, so what I would be doing is, is I would be getting a soil test kit and I'd be getting a handle on what the pH is doing. Yeah. For starters. Well, the if pH in alkaline. Yeah. No, the pH looks pretty good. It's just below seven. Okay. Well, that's 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 good news. Mm. Um. Yeah. Look. Um. Maybe, maybe uh, just keep keep an eye on the pH. That's all I'd say. Just keep, right. keep a watch on it. Yeah. And and what about eating the produce? The the tomatoes and the zucchinis and beans, even beans, seem they look they look really good. Yeah. They're not just you know malformed. Yeah. Are the color the coloration in the leaves okay? Coloration in the leaves is okay, but they're very twisted. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, you know, that's cut. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the tomatoes. Yeah, that that's probably got more to do with yeah the, the contamination for sure. So yeah, um, the tomatoes. Yeah, look that that can be a common thing too with the cold as well. Ah, uh, the cold. I mean, it hasn't and been the a particularly good year, unfortunately, for tomatoes. Yeah. I can tell you. Yeah. So um, well, I had um, some um, someone asking a question there. I thought. Um, Yeah, there's a question, Craig. What is a good soil test oh, kit um, from Claire? Yeah. Don't, don't go buy, don't go buying a um, a pH meter. Um, they're a waste of time. Buy a, a test kit. Manutech is the one that I generally buy. It's about twenty five dollars. Um, it comes with a powder and a and a um, and a liquid along with a. Um, a gauge pad so it's got all the different colors on it to work out what um and, and when you use them don't use heaps of soil and use dig down a little bit so that you uh you you, you know down about 50 mil so you can get um, a couple of bits of um, samples of soil in in that area and then test it all at once uh, yeah i'm actually working on another book that um it's actually complete i just got to get the editor and the graphics designer to, to it, but uh, it's called Edible Gardening Secrets that actually deals with um, all the pH problems and so forth. I hope to have that published this year. So um, that'll be another one that will help. It'll form the trilogy. So, anyway. so, so we'll go with one last question, I think, um, Craig. Yep. Does the dig method work on clay soil? The no dig sure. method? Does the dig work, the no dig method work on yeah, clay Yeah, absolutely soil? it does. Yeah, look, uh, um, I think people get a bit um, um, head up with clay soil. Clay soil is a really good soil. It's mineral rich and it's alluvial. It's it's great stuff. It just sticks to our boots and it's hard to work with. So my my method with no dig is doing exactly that. No dig, you, you know. Um, but it's got to be mulched and it's got to have a covering so that the composting insects that are down deep, um, and they do it best, I can assure you. You know, if you, if you provide the forest floor, you'll eventually get the forest soil. And if you think about um, exactly that, a forest floor, if you scratch back the mulch in the forest floor, you can dig to a shoulder's depth in beautiful, rich, open, friable soil. And that's not because two blokes have been there turning it over with a pitchfork or, or, or putting in leaf litter and so forth. The insects do that, and they've been doing that for thousands of years very, very well. They'll do it much better than we ever do. And if you can leave your soil clay, or makes no difference what sort of soil it is, intact but covered with mulch, and feed the soil from above, those insects will come and they'll start to aerate and turn that soil over for you. It's a bit like having a dog and barking too. Seriously, let them do the work. And if you can continue to do that, and always make sure you're topping up your mulch and feeding it, and by that I mean, don't put it on too thick. Don't put four inches of mulch on top. It still needs to breathe. It still needs to get that that watering. You know, when you're watering, you still want to get 
penetration down into the soil. You only want it on about 25 millimetres or an inch in the old scale. That's as thick as you want it. And particularly with edibles, you want to look, choose something like sugarcane mulch or there's a new one on the market, um, Who Flung Done from um, Neutrog. Um, that's, that's a very good product. Um, that, that's an activated mulch and, and probably bamboo mulch. They're the three picks for me. I would stay away from um, barks or red gum chips unless they're native gardens. Um, they can tend to generally have saps and tannins and resins in them that over time mm -hmm. can become a bit toxic to your edible. So, um, so I hope that helps. I hope you enjoyed tonight. I certainly have. And um, I'll I'm very happy to do uh, more with you if you want. Okay, that's been great, Craig. Thank you. I have this great image in my head about growing garlic with tomato plants coming up in the middle. I reckon that would look fantastic. Well, it does. And yeah. And it's just a great way of, you know, just, yeah, yeah. it's a, a different way of growing things. So. Yeah. So thank you, Craig. And thanks to Kylie and the Macedon Rangers Seed Savers for organising this and to the Newham Garden Sale for sponsoring um, Craig tonight. It's been yes, great. Thank you very much. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been great. All the very best. Okay, thank you. See you later. And Talk thanks everyone out. for coming. Bye.